Go ahead, Delia. Great. Uh, thanks, Anu. And again, uh, thank you very much to all of you who had had the opportunity to join this, e this evening in Texas and uh, whatever time it might be where you're joining from. Um, I really appreciate uh, seeing all of our alumni come together around these webinars. It's been um, a real bright point of the last couple of years that um, we've gotten uh, some creative ways to uh, connect with, with more of you more regularly um, and to keep you up to date on some of the most exciting things happening around uh, the department. So that's, um, what brings us together uh, tonight. Um, so we've we've been going through a series of these webinars. Some of you have been here regularly, I think, um, having some, some of the um, very societally relevant uh, research uh, areas uh, that our faculty are involved in, um, and especially people who have um, gotten themselves engaged in, in broader impacts and, and aspects of their research. And certainly uh, my colleague, Brian Corgel fits that fits that bill. So. Uh, Brian is, has been with the department um, his whole academic career, but he came to us um, after a postdoc at uh, University College Dublin and before that um, his PhD in chemical engineering at, at UCLA. And he's really become a, an absolute pioneer in, uh, in solar cell technologies. He's, he's been engaged at the interface of academia and industry for a long time. Um, being the, the director of an industry university research center on this topic and, and has taken over um, more recently as the director of UT's Energy Institute for their broadening the, the scope of, of his engagement and leadership in this area. Um, on the sort of research academic side, uh, he's also involved in, in service in the community. He's, he's an editor of the journal Chemistry Materials. Um, and he's um, just very active in the, the nanomaterials community in general, which is also my area. So, so he, he works on, on things near and dear to me as well. Um, very prolific um, uh, publication record, um, uh, but he's also an entrepreneur and an, and an avid inventor. So he has co-founded two companies, Innovolite and, and Pinion, and has received um, a long list of honors, um, including the Professional Progress Award from the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, AICHE, um, and is a fellow of the National Academy of Engineering. So thank you, uh, Brian, um, for uh, taking the time to, to meet with us tonight and to tell everybody about your, your work. Go ahead and take it away. Great. Thanks, Delia. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I will share my screen. Great. Yeah. So, um, so this is, this is fun. I ha haven't given a, kind of a general talk to a sort of general audience about my work in a while i think with uh with covid and everything going online and all of that it's uh good to see the the world sort of starting to open although this is a virtual talk still but that that's that's still great um thanks to everyone for for showing up so what i wanted to do is just give kind of a broad scope of where a little bit where the solar um power industry is right now as a also a bit of a, just a, you know tutorial what what's a solar cell so we can have a conversation about it. Um, I took over as the director of the Energy Institute on September one, so I've been thinking a lot about energy in a, a pretty broad context. Um, you know, um, some of the, the work that I do in my lab, but also how um, how it impacts society and where society is going right now and. Um, it's a really interesting time for, for energy. Um, if you think about what's happening, you've got um, the European Union, you have China, you have the United States making net zero uh, carbon emissions goals. You've got um, industry uh, companies all the way from Amazon to Ford uh, and ExxonMobil. So ExxonMobil made an announcement to become a net zero uh, greenhouse gas emitter by, by 2050. Um, so why is everybody doing this? Um, this, is, this is a picture I took in Beijing. Um, Beijing's a, you know, uh, maybe more extreme example of greenhouse gas emissions and that sort of thing. But um, this is what we're trying to, to address, you know, in, in the future. So if we look at um, where CO2 emissions are coming from, uh, they're coming from all over the world. Uh, in a variety of places, and CO2 emissions are uh, 
linked to energy use and the more energy use people have, uh, the more economic prosperity they have. And so energy use is not going to decrease. And if we think about reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 emissions, it's not gonna happen because people stop using energy. If anything, um, energy use is gonna continue to climb uh, throughout the world. And most of that energy use are uh, fossil fuels. So if you look at the mix of the various energy sources, um, it's predominantly fossil fuels. And my talk's about solar. And if you look at that little sliver of yellow, uh, this is data, um, Scott Tinker put this together back in 2019. And at that point, solar was just starting to uh, come onto the market and make its appearance. But this is a question that uh, I think everybody's asking is how do we get to an energy future with zero greenhouse gas emissions? Um, how's ExxonMobil going to do it? How is uh, everyone going to do it? The United States, European Union, uh, China. And I think it's a, a really complicated um, problem. As I said, we're, we're not going to stop using energy. And if anything, continue to use it. I think fossil fuels are always going to be part of the, the energy mix. And so if you want to get to net zero carbon emissions, you have to think about things like carbon capture, carbon storage, uh, converting CO2 to, to products. All of those things are really challenging. CO2 is a very stable molecule. Um, you can do storage, uh, but ideally you want to take the CO2 converted to something else and carbon capture. And those are energy intensive processes. So carbon capture, uh, where is that energy uh, going to come from? And so another aspect of this is low carbon energy sources. So wind and solar, geothermal, hydrogen, people are talking about all of these things. That's part of, part of the mix. And some of these low carbon energy sources feed into the carbon capture. If you're doing direct air capture, there's a huge amount of entropy you have to overcome with, with a lot of work. Uh, if you're burning fossil fuels to do that, it doesn't make a lot of sense to start capturing CO2 out, out of the air. And then uh, we look at materials. So some materials are inherently uh, large CO2 emitters, steel and cement, chemicals. How do we lower the carbon footprint of those? What are the energy sources? And so that kind of sets a setting for, for solar. Um, when people talk about renewables, that tends to imply wind and it tends to imply solar. Um, solar, we've got sunlight, okay? I mean, you have night and day, but um, this is a, an energy source that uh, hits our planet and we can utilize it. If, I mean, if someone off the street was to ask me why the energy transition is happening now, I would say it's largely because of the significant decrease in the in the cost of these renewable energy sources of wind and solar. Wind got off to a, a faster start with a decrease in price and solar has um, followed behind in the last in the last 10 years. And so those price reductions have come about due to um, major technological improvements and also scale of manufacturing and a combination of those things and and now you have a, a situation where solar is cost competitive with fossil fuels. Um, but people still ask the question, is solar really cost competitive? Uh, is it actually something that can be scaled? And so that's a, some of what I want to talk about. Um, this is a, a, a plot, a chart from Lazard. Uh, they, they come out with a a plot every year of the levelized cost of electricity comparing different energy resources. Uh, so unsubsidized utility scale solar is cost competitive with natural gas. Um, I think most people know that now, but um, even a couple of years ago, you, you could talk to some folks from utilities and they, they didn't quite get um, how inexpensive solar had become. I think now it's it's kind of common knowledge, and certainly it depends on the land. You have to have the land resources. You have to have uh, the power lines and, and all that. But the fact is, is that under many many conditions, without subsidy, 
utility scale solar is cost competitive with natural gas. So if you're generating electricity, does it make sense to continue to do natural gas? Uh, or does it make sense to, to build if you're going to build and expand to, to go with solar? And wind is also um, cost competitive. But solar also, um, the cost of solar depends on where you're getting it, how you're using it. So we tend to break up um, our solar usage into three, primarily three categories. So utility scale solar, which I would say uh, our solar facilities of at least 50 megawatts, probably 100 megawatts and, and, and larger. Um, within ERCOT in Texas, if you're above 10 megawatts um, in your solar producer, you get kicked up into a, a different sort of category. So in some ways, ERCOT defines utility scale solar as 10 megawatts, but um, that's, I mean, it's a decent amount of electricity. Uh, you have to have about 50 acres of land to put 10 megawatts. That's about enough power to um, power about 1800 homes per year. It's, so it's not tiny, but uh, when we talk about utility scale solar, we tend to be talking about um, 250 megawatts, 500 megawatts, uh, even up to a gigawatt of, of, of electricity. And because of that scale, the price scales um, with the amount of solar you're installing. And so the cost is really low. Then you have um, commercial scale solar, which would be kind of like solar on large warehouses and, and things like that. That's a little bit more expensive than utility, but, um, but still relatively inexpensive. And then you've got residential solar. So residential solar, which when most people think of solar, I think a lot of people think about solar panels on your houses. And that's still a relatively expensive form of uh, solar, solar power. The nice thing about it is it um, gives people some independence from the grid. So there's a lot of work towards how can you use those solar panels on your roof to become more energy independent, for your house to become more resilient to their power outages and things like this. And as more and more people get um, buy electric vehicles, now you don't have to buy gasoline. You can take the solar that you're harvesting off your roof and, and power your car. So I wanted to do a, a thought experiment um, that I asked one of my current students, Joshua Hammond. So Josh, Josh is co-supervised by me and, and one of my colleagues, my, uh, Professor Michael Baldea. And um, Josh likes to do calculations. So I was like, hey, I have a, I have a little homework problem for you. So um, if we consider how much electricity is produced in Texas every year, so 429.8 terawatt hours of electricity is produced in Texas, um, some of that's consumed outside of Texas. So the annual en energy consumption is 365 terawatts, terawatt hours. So when we think about energy use, you've got electricity. So that's the stuff that's generated by wind, solar, natural gas, coal, et cetera. You convert it to electricity, it keeps the lights on uh, in your HVAC systems. The other 50% uh, of our energy use is, you know, the um, natural gas we use for heating, uh, chemical processes, things like that, um, gasoline in your car. Uh, so that's kind of when we talk about electricity use versus um, energy kind of power, that's what we're thinking. So um, what if we blanketed university lands with solar? The UT uh, system has 2.1 million acres of land. What if we just blanketed it with, with solar? Um, the UT system, so University of Texas and Texas A&M split the oil and gas revenue off the university lands, which is, is about a billion dollars a year. So how much money would we make if we just blanketed it with solar? So this was the homework problem I gave to Josh. Um, first of all, if you did that, you'd produce about 1,800 terawatt hours uh, per year. So that's about four times the Texas electricity use. So that's, that's a lot. Um, how much money would you make off that electricity? Uh, your revenue would be $46 billion. Your annual operating costs um, spread over the life of the, the solar cell. So the inverters die before, like your, your power electronics die before the solar panels. You have to replace all that stuff. So it's about $15 billion a year in annual cost. So you, you basically make $32 billion a year if you just put solar cells. 
So why don't we just do that? Um, I mean, there are a lot of issues like, okay, you're going to block all the land with solar cells. There are cows grazing on the land and, and all of that. Maybe you still, you could block half, half the land. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is that you'd need $780 trillion to do it. So this is an example of one of the challenges to getting to the future is, is the enormous capital cost to change the way you do things, $780 trillion. Um, if you had 0% interest, so if you just had $780 trillion laying around, it would take you about 25 years to break even. So even though you're making $32 billion a year, you, you know it's gonna take you 25 years to, um, to break even. Most people don't have that kind of money laying around, so you have to take loans. And so the break-even period is actually longer than the lifetime of the solar facility. So there was a recent call by Department of Energy looking at 50-year lifetime solar farms. And that's a major research challenge because solar panels don't, don't last that long. How do you, what do you do in a solar farm to maybe monitor degradation of solar panels, make them last longer, that sort of thing? It's a major research challenge. So this is kind of where the solar power industry is. We're sort of on the cusp of just the potential for dramatic change and decarbonization in the way we you know, make energy, but you also have to get the materials to make the solar cells. That's a challenge. Another challenge is that um, solar is intermittent. You need batteries. Um, the, the solar pr production changes during the day, obviously there's daytime and nighttime, but it also changes throughout the year. So the most of the solar, uh, the maximum amount of solar power is generated in the, in the spring, in the summer, and then in the winter there's less sunlight. Um, how can you level out the, that energy um, production over the year? You need some sort of long duration storage and that's an unsolved problem right now. So what do you do, what do, you do with that energy? And people talk about um, storing it underground, uh, in the form of, uh, of hydrogen, for example, something like that. It's an unsolved problem. Uh, for the short-term storage, that is, it's an unsolved problem at the scale that we need. If we really went to terawatt scale solar um, in Texas, for example, uh, that requires lots and lots of battery materials, cobalt, lithium, et cetera. That part is unsolved, but for the scale that we have now, the cost of batteries continue to go down. They continue to perform even better. People are getting electric vehicles, things like that. And so solar plus storage, utility scale solar plus storage is about eight cents per kilowatt hour. It's, it's actually cheaper than the residential, um, residential solar, which is around 10 cents per kilowatt hour or so. Uh, so that's pretty remarkable and that's changing uh, a, a lot of things as well economically. So another thing, if we are going to use solar, we need to electrify everything. So if you think about chemical processes that use high temperature, right now you heat natural gas to get to those temperatures. Um, if you're gonna use electricity, you've gotta come up with new technologies, elect electrical boilers, things like that. And for certain temperature ranges, those can be really, really challenging problems. And, um, but they're important. So if we think about where the carbon emissions are coming from, how we use energy, again, about, you know, half of it's on electricity, the other half is on, on other things. So industrial processes can account for about 25% of, um, of carbon emissions. You've got transportation, so cars, that's another 25% or so, and then you've got residential and commercial. Um, how do we lower the carbon emissions from industrial, the industrial sector that requires these high heat? Do we electrify it? What are the challenges there? I mean, the other thing about just putting all that solar in West Texas is there aren't enough transmission lines to get it throughout Texas, right? Right now, we're already, um, saturated our, our transmission lines from West Texas and all the solar developers I've talked to are 
are not even developing in West Texas because of that. And they're, they're looking at other parts of, of, of the state and East Texas and things like that. I think that's, that's great for, for spreading out the solar development, but there's, there are a lot more solar resources in West Texas that we could utilize, uh, but, but difficult to, to get it to the rest of the state at the moment. Um, the use of solar power continues to grow. Um, so back in about 2010, 2009, if you looked at the amount of electricity generated by solar, it was, it was less than 0.1%. It was basically was nothing. And in the, in the past 10 years, we've gone, risen from that to uh, May of, of last year, about 5% of the electricity in the United States was generated from solar. So um, really large, large gains. So what is the state of the art uh, of solar cells? So we looked at some of the economics, but where where can we go? How are, how are things being developed? So uh, one technical thing we need to know about is something called the power conversion efficiency of a solar cell. So what that is is how much of the power in the in the sun and sunlight can be converted directly to electricity. So at midday, the solar radiance is about a thousand watts per meter squared. Um, I always remember like 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared. And um, so, so the power conversion efficiency is how much of that power you can convert to electricity. So I know in, in thermodynamics, one of the first things we think about is, well, what is the fundamental limit to how much work you can get out of an engine and, and things like that? So if we ask ourselves that question about a solar cell, I, I, I think it's important. Can we use all the, the, the energy in the sun uh, or what are the limitations? And sunlight's freely available, but PV electricity is, is not free. So you've got to have the materials, you have to manufacture the, the solar cells, you got to transport the solar cells to where they go. And then once you have them in the field, there are costs, installation, maintenance, operations, uh, we call a lot of that balance of systems costs. Um, all of those things are, are still decreasing and solar continues to become uh, less expensive, uh, but they're but they're not free, and so um, there tends to be a trade off in terms of technology between the highest efficiency devices and the cost to make them. And so uh, the most expensive solar cells are called multi junction solar cells, and they're um, found on satellites up in space. They're they're expensive, uh, like a hundred dollars per per peak watt compared to terrestrial applications, terrestrial solar cells are less than a dollar per peak watt. So much more expensive, but you need them to work well and get as much power as possible for these satellites. So, um, so and there aren't a lot of options for, for power up there. So, the, so people use them and buy them. Um, but on, on earth, on, in, for terrestrial applications, uh, we can't spend that much money. Um, we're essentially competing with natural gas for power, and we only have a, a certain amount uh, of money we can spend on electricity. So there are many different solar cell technologies. Um, the National Renewable Energy Lab has a roadmap of record uh, cell efficiencies for the different uh, technologies. So the highest efficiency devices are these multi-junction tandem cells. Um, they're very expensive to make. They're difficult to make with large areas. So they, they're very small area devices, but you can get very high efficiency. So getting close to 50% efficiency. So we've never made a solar cell that can convert more than 50% of the incident light into power. Okay, so that's that's like one um, one ceiling at the moment, and then most of the solar cells are are less than that. And I'll talk about this in a bit. But for a so-called single junction solar cell, the re the um, the limiting efficiency is thirty four percent. And so all of these technologies, like a crystalline silicon cell, a thin film technology, thin film technology like SIGs or cadmium telluride, um, emerging PV like perovskites. They're all limited to below 34%. They're all trying to get up to hit that. And what you can see on this roadmap is that some of them are, are pretty um, close to that. So how does a solar cell work? You need a semiconductor, okay, like silicon. The semiconductor absorbs light. 
electrons in a typical semiconductor are mostly tied up in, in their bonds, okay? And to generate current, electrical current, the electrons have to get out of those bonds. So the semiconductor absorbs a photon, kicks an electron out of the bond, that becomes a conduction electron that can move through the solid. It leaves behind what's called a hole and that can also move. So the solar cell works by the light generating an electron hole pair and then the electron hole pair separating in the, in the semiconductor. So there needs to be some driving force for that electron hole separ separator. So the uh, a solar cell is not just made of one semiconductor. You have to have one semiconductor interface with another one. Um, if that other semiconductor is actually the same material, you can do what's called doping and make one side P-type and one type one side N-type. Or you can do something like in cadmium telluride, you add a second semiconductor called cadmium sulfide. That creates a, a built-in electric field, which once the electron and hole pair are formed, will sweep those two uh, negative charge and pos positive charge uh, out of the material. But you have to have some sort of junction, some electrical contact that enables you to extract the electron hole. So every solar cell is this basic, simple device that has a semiconductor that does the light absorption, and another semiconductor that essentially creates a built-in uh, potential to force the electron hole to separate, and then two electrodes on the top and the bottom, uh, and then some sort of uh, mechanical support. Basic design of, of every semiconductor. So the, the semiconductor you use matters. Um, so if I look at the solar spectrum, okay, this is the, the light. I've got infrared light, I've got visible light. It sort of ends in ultraviolet. And we want to absorb as much of that light as possible. So a semiconductor has a, a certain energy that's required to photo excite an electron and hole. And so if the, um, the photon energy is less than that, the photon's not absorbed. So ideally you wanna use as low of a, a band gap uh, as possible to absorb as many photons as possible, but you end up getting another form of loss of energy, which are, which is, are called thermalization losses. So when a high energy photon or high relative to the band gaps absorbed, you initially conserve the energy in the electron and hole, and then it turns out that the electron hole rapidly relaxed to their, uh, the bottom of what's called the conduction band, top of the, the valence band, and you lose that energy as heat. And the, the, the electron hole before that are called hot electrons, hot holes. No one's figured out how to extract hot electrons or hot holes very efficiently from a device. People have spent decades trying to do it. It's uh, just not been possible. Um, so you lose that energy. So there's an, an optimum band gap, which turns out to be between uh, like 1.1 and 1.4 electron volts, which is uh, kind of at the red edge, red near infrared edge of the solar spectrum. That's where silicon is, and that's where cadmium telluride is. Also, indium phosphide, gallium arsenide. It's expensive to make indium phosphide and gallium arsenide. So the two competing technologies for solar cells now are silicon and cadmium telluride. And so this is where um, price and like where you're making it and global competitiveness. And one of the main reasons that um, Trump and Obama before him put in tariffs on Chinese solar, cell, solar cells. In China, um, the technology is mostly silicon. There's very little solar cell manufacturing being done in the United States. It all moved to China for a variety of reasons. Uh, but one, one solar cell technology that is made by an American company called First Solar is cadmium telluride. And uh, silicon solar cell manufacturing is heavily subsidized by the, the Chinese government. They put in lots and lots of money um, to make it as cost competitive as possible. Um, but the process to make silicon is relatively expensive and it also generates quite, quite a bit of waste. Um, this is just a diagram of, uh, of silicon solar cell making that one of my colleagues in, in, uh, at Colorado State, Sampath, made just showing how complicated and expensive it is, high temperature 
a lot of waste products. Cadmium telluride, on the other hand, you can use relatively impure starting materials and you make panels by sublimation. So you heat up a, a pane of glass to 350, 400C, cadmium telluride, you sublime it, you sublime cadmium sulfide. Um, you, make, you make panels on a roll to roll process on this glass in about two minutes per, per panel, super high throughput, relatively low cost. And that's the technology that First Solar has developed. And so um, uh, that's like when people talk about thin film solar cells, they're talking about cadmium telluride and the rest is silicon. And silicon, you can have polycrystalline cells or, or single crystal cells. And if you look back in 2018, this is like a Bloomberg thing. The only company that was in the safety zone for existing Super uh, busy at that day. time for, for a long time was- and We took an uh, open note quiz today. <laughs> that where you just write 500 words and cool i don't know someone needs to mute themselves but um so the the, the cadmium telluride uh was the first solar as a u.s company and because the manufacturing wasn't being subsidized by um governmental en entity it was actually cost competitive they were in the safety zone and they're still still doing great um and so um so essentially a lot of the uh, international politics around solar cell manufacturing comes back to this difference between cadmium telluride and silicon. And worldwide, silicon still dominates the market for the most part, almost 10%. But cadmium telluride within the United States, uh, because, you know, largely because of the protection of the tariffs the last few years, is now about 40% of the market share. Um, the the challenge though is that you know all the cadmium telluride solar solar panels are only used for utility scale solar power so first solar only makes solar panels for utility scale not for residential so when you look at residential solar installers who are putting silicon panels on their roofs on their their houses then the the tariffs that are raising the price of their solar panels aren't aren't really helping them and they're not really helping us as consumers if we are residential solar customers. Um, on the other hand, our utility scale solar um, farms that are largely being you know, made of cadmium teller right now, that electricity is, is as cheap as possible. So what's the future of solar? So a uh, tiny bit about my research. I, I really started diving into solar cell research in about 2005. Um, it's interesting for me to look at this roadmap. Again, it's super busy. If you've never looked at this before, it's probably going to be just a, a bunch of spots, meaningless spots. But um, if you look a little bit to the right, so past 2005, there are several new lines of technologies that have been created. One of the most exciting being uh, perovskite solar cells, which are in the red circles with the little yellow dots. The first dot on the roadmap there is uh, 2012. Um, the first solar cell with, with perovskites was actually made a bit before that, but I guess they just randomly picked 2012 to start start their their roadmap. And now, you know, after 10 years of work, um, the efficiency is getting close to the Shockley Quiser limit for for perovskite so that's that's been really exciting and there have been other other examples of that i got into solar because the first company i started in Novolay, initially we were doing uh, lighting we were taking silicon quantum dots trying to replace the light bulb and make solid state lighting and saw an opportunity to get into the solar market around that time 2005 or so and so Enovolite developed a, a, what's called a solar ink. You would put that on a single crystal silicon solar cell and make what's called a selective emitter device. And so you could take single crystal silicon panels and bump up their efficiency by, by 3% or so, which was enough to, if you had that product, you would kind of control the, the market. So everybody wanted it. Um, but I, I felt like at that time that it wasn't really really dramatically revolutionizing or changing uh, the price of, of solar. And so I, I started um, thinking, what can we do that's like really different? 
And so my group makes nanomaterials. We, we started to develop a, a synthetic route to make a material called copperinium selenide, or if it's gallium, copperinium gallium selenide, or also called SIGs, and make this paint. And the idea is to try to make solar cells like you might print newspaper. And um, we can do that. I mean, it was a hard project. We published several papers on this. We can make solar cells on glass um, using ink. We can paint paint solar cells on surfaces. I worked with an artist who made solar cells on rocks. Uh, we've done this on plastic. You can put it on paper. Uh, you, can, you can link these things together and, and get a lot of power, uh, relatively speaking, a lot of power. Um, it's not commercially available yet because the efficiencies are still, um, still too low from where you need to be, but you can do this. You can paint solar cells and um, that's been really exciting. And so I direct a solar research center. This has been our roadmap since 2009. So basically taking a thin film technology like cadmium telluride and adding layers on it with uh, so semiconductors of different band gaps to make multi-junction solar cells made of thin film materials that are inexpensive to process. So instead of taking three, five semiconductors, we call them like gallium arsenide doing molecular beam epitaxy that's extremely slow, extremely expensive, limited to small area device structures, we take that same multi-junction concept to large areas with materials that are inexpensive, easy to process, and get above the shock, shockley quasar limit without increasing cost. And so this has been our, our dream and our kind of mandate within the center for the last um, you know, 12, thir 13 years. And uh, we've made a lot of progress to that. And the fields also moved in, in that direction as well. I'll probably show this briefly at the end, but one of the, the new technology lines on the, the roadmap of device efficiencies is a tandem solar cell of silicon plus perovskite. It's not really getting, I, my dream and goal is always to be, kind of get around silicon manufacturing because, because it's expensive. Um, but, you know, it, if you can build off it, I mean, it has scale. And, and so combining silicon plus perovskites, that, that stuff is emerging now. Um, several of the perovskite startup companies that are out there, that's what they're trying to do as opposed to single junction perovskite cells. So um, we're, we're never going to carpet 2.1 million acres of university lands with, with solar cells. I mean, I think for a variety of reasons, we might, you know, put more solar out there. But what we really need is also solar in our lives, you know, where it makes sense. And you can embed solar cells into windows and you can make solar cells that are semi-transparent. There are people, uh, including us at UT, looking at what's called agrivoltaics. So can you have solar power production combined with growing crops? Okay, so can you raise the solar panels up off the ground and grow corn and things like that? So that when you put the solar panels out in the field, you're, you're not sacrificing food production if you can, right? I mean, if you put a solar panel in the desert, there's no food production going on there. But if you want to put it somewhere where you can grow food, how do you do that? So agrivoltaics, um, electric vehicles, plus solar power. I mean, this has also been a bit of a transformational, I mean, I'd say almost revolution in terms of thinking about uh, decarbonization of like transportation, the fact that electric vehicles now have really come on the scene. You see them all over 10, 12 years ago, they were kind of a weird no novelty. Now you have electric vehicles. People are talking about electrifying um, many, many cars. Cap Metro uh, in Austin just is in the process. I don't think it's quite happened yet, but electrifying their, their bus system, the entire bus system being electrified. Uh, so where do you get the electricity? Well, if you can get it from solar, you are decarbonizing the, the transportation sector. Um, people are talking a lot about solar for um, community electricity independence. Can you build homes and, and communities that are microgrids that you can, you can essentially be disconnected from the grid if you need to, if there's an event or something like that. Um, local, local solar for resilience. Um, people are thinking about this a lot, like in Puerto Rico when uh, 
There was no power. One of the things that people were shipping to Puerto Rico were some solar panels so that they could have electricity. What, what's the role in solar for energy and community resilience? Uh, industrial decarbonization, how do, you, how do you electrify processes? How do you use an intermittent energy source like solar, solar power? Um, and then looking at different form factors for solar. So semi-transparent solar for windows, for greenhouses, things like that. And even putting solar cells on electric vehicles. So um, these are all things people are working on. And uh, as I think Delia mentioned, and I mentioned briefly, I, I direct a center, it's called the Center for Solar Powered Future. It's an NSF Industry University Cooperative Research Center. We're a phase three center. Uh, we're in like our 12th year or something like that. Uh, it's a multi-university partnership. So University of Texas at Austin with Colorado State. Also, we have projects at Arizona State and Texas A&M. Uh, my um, colleague who uh, directs the, the, the site, the Colorado State, is, is Sampath. Sampath has been working on cadmium telluride since 1991. Um, their, their group is one of the world's leading groups on cadmium telluride. A lot of their technology developments have been what's enabled for solar to be where they are today. Uh, and it's great to be working, working with them. We have 17 industry members ranging from BMW and Tesla to First Solar, 5M Plus and Materials su Supplier, MRS goes a solar developer, um, Shell, uh, Yacht Energy is a Austin startup that does energy storage. Sonova, uh, largest residential solar installer in Texas based out of Houston. So it's a really great group of, of um, companies working with us in, in academia to try to get to this future where there, is, where there are net zero carbon emissions. And you're, you're not going to have 100% solar power generation to get there, but solar is a key part of that equation. And so um, I'll just kind of say in terms of technologies, I think the most exciting emerging technology is probably the, the concept of the thin film tandem multi-junction cells or combined with silicon. And right now there's been a lot of progress towards the perovskite material plus silicon. And um, that could be another manufacturing boon, uh, boon I think is the right word, good thing um, for, for the United States. Um, and there are some really strong and very competitive European companies also looking at that. So very exciting. Um, and I'm gonna end on, on this slide because I think this is, this is really the real future, which is our, our students. And so this is one of my favorite pictures of all time of one of my former PhD students, Vikas Reddy. Um, he works at Samsung around Austin now and Leslie Phillip, who was an undergrad who worked in my group for maybe three years uh, making solar cells. And uh, she works at BASF right now and doing great. And um, this picture, I think they took at like one in the morning or something, and they look extremely happy. They made a solar cell on paper, linked up all these devices, and it worked. And they were wrapping it around their wrist, and it still worked, and wrapping it around water bottles and all of that. And so um, it's one of my favorite pictures. So um, happy to answer any questions that you all have. Thanks so much, Brian. Um, so the floor is open for questions. Um, you can put them in the chat or um, as Anu mentioned earlier, raise your hand and unmute and ask your own question. Or if you want, just unmute. There's not too many of us. I don't think we'll be shouting over each other, but see, we're already getting questions in the chat coming in. Um, yeah. Well, so I'll, I'll answer. Go ahead. I'll answer. So this question about why is cadmium telluride only in utility scale solar? Is it a market thing? Yeah, it it's essentially a, mar a market thing. Um, one of the, the companies in our solar center, uh, Toledo Solar, is a startup based out of Ohio that is actually trying to um, develop cadmium telluride for these other markets like residential. But first solar uh, had a really interesting business model when they started. They, they decided that they had to show developers how to actually make utility scale solar farms. So they uh, 
for a while were essentially a power company. So they made panels, but they were making money off of, they would, they would own their own installation, sell the power and uh, made their money that way. They, they sold their, their like power business maybe two years ago. And so now they're making money off of just panel, they're sold panel manufacturer. But because of that model, they, they've never really branched out into residential. There was also a lot of concern at one point about toxicity of cadmium and not wanting to get it all over. So to get around those, those concerns, they, they just go utility scale solar and they have a really interesting recycling program, which is also a really big difference uh, with silicon. So anyway, that, that's, that's that one. Um, if, that, if every house in Texas had solar panels, how much power would that produce? That's a really good uh, homework problem for my student, Josh. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, you would think that people would have enough power for, for their homes. I think the, uh, the, the challenge a little bit with, with that um, concept is people probably would need storage also at their homes. And right now, the batteries and the storage at, at their home is relatively expensive. Um, so, but I think we're moving in that direction maybe to, for people to have solar, so all, everyone on their house maybe. Um, what is your opinion on companies like Exxon that make these net zero goals, but only for scope one, two emissions when 95% plus of the emissions are scope three? That's a great question. Um, I, well, I mean, I think it's I think it's great in terms of better than nothing. I mean, the fact that ExxonMobil made that statement is 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 significant. So um, the fact that it's so for those who don't know, you've, the scope one and two emissions are kind of what your company is directly responsible for in terms of CO two, and scope three is uh, if you're an energy producer, oil and gas uh, company. Scope three are the emissions that your customers have. So, like you, you know, us driving our car around, things like that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's really people don't know how to get to the scope three emissions. I think um, ExxonMobil doesn't want to overpromise, so I think they're doing maybe what what they can to control what they have. But uh, like Shell, for example, is going net zero, and they're including scope three. And I think that is where most of the companies are going towards. So anyway, my, my opinion is it's great that, that everyone's getting on board. Um, I also think like data companies, Amazon, Google, uh, Apple need to take more responsibility for carbon emissions also, and not just buy like credits and things like that. So that's my opinion there. Um, agrivoltaics have an important benefit in that the solar panels properly placed enable the rate of water evaporation from the land to be reduced helping to reduce the amount of water to grow crops yeah absolutely great great comment um that's super important uh another thing that i've idea i've heard tossed around is um the importance of the soil for uh capturing and storing co2 so when you uh, plant crops and you have to till the soil that, that releases a lot of co2 um, and so that that whole ecosystem of how solar cells can be combined with water use especially and and also potentially co2 um, is important Let's see i guess other questions one in here about um, perovskite solar cell durability life expectancy uh, a few years ago seemed to be measured in days what's the latest progress on improving <laughs> durability yeah no um it's the durability has gotten much much better there are packaging strategies people at least in the lab are looking at months of of stability another thing people had struggled a lot with was hysteresis and device response where you shine the light and it responds really well and then it kind of loses its response and depending on where you're at you'd have that transient uh response transient performance and that has um people have figured out how to how to get around that as well um 
So startup companies have gotten pretty sophisticated about this. Also the formulation of your perovskite, there's something called the kitchen sink perovskite, which is like where you just throw in a bunch of cations and anions and that stuff tends to be um, more stable. But I, I wouldn't say stability is a solved problem. You, you have to have a material that's out in the field for you know, 20, 30 years. And I don't think perovskites are quite there. They're very sensitive to uh, to moisture, especially, but um, a lot of progress being made. There's a question about, um, how do you see the massive amount of energy needed to create sustainable aviation fuel slash e-fuels technology as an opportunity to consume excess energy from the grid and offset swings from the renewable part uh, on the grid um yeah so are you are you reading yeah so energy storage in general mm -hmm. um yeah so so there's a lot of discussion about like shipping so shipping aviation those sorts of fuels i think shipping is probably easier to address than than planes okay so you know i've heard people talk about like ammonia for that um, I think that there are solutions that people are putting forward for aviation fuel. Um, I think that the price of renewables coming down, you, you know, okay, you can feed electricity into the grid. That's, that's really important. But I think using that electricity to decarbonize the industrial sector, like aviation fuels, trying to get to renewable energy fuels that way are, are really important. So I, I think there's going to be a lot of progress towards that. Um, it's, you know, it's a challenging problem still, but I, I think a lot of people are starting to work on it. Um, I see this one. Have you studied the drop in efficiency of a solar cell over time? How is the efficiency maintained? Yeah, so I, so the efficiency um, drops over time for all solar cell technologies. Um, that's, that's one thing that, you know, da data is not entirely transparent out there for it. You know, manufacturers, um, don't necessarily want to share their data about that, like their actual data. And then, um, folks that have solar producing facilities tend to keep their data cl close to their chest, but all solar cells degrade over time. Uh, one mechanism is called potential induced degradation, um, PID. Um, so, so you have, you can have things like, you know, dopants kind of migrating, um, a typical failure mechanism in cadmium telluride used to be copper at the back contact diffusing into the device. And they've spent lots and lots of time trying to solve that problem. Um, but yeah, the, this is the challenge with getting solar facilities that will last longer than 30 years is that every solar panel degrades slowly over time and no one knows how to completely solve that problem. There's a lot of research that's still going into it. Um, and so that's the challenge. Um, pe people, in terms of improving efficiency is thinking about you know, how to operate the solar cells. And if you can sense what's happening internally to the solar cell, you can maybe modify your, your operation kind of like the way you might do for batteries uh, in terms of charging where you have advanced battery management systems that can monitor battery life and and act accordingly um is there efficient ways to collect light to run photochemical process for manufacturing to replace thermal um i i think so that so so i, I was talking about photovoltaic devices and you can um you know, take that electricity and pump it into some electronics to, to heat things up that you can do that. There's a lot of interest like out of Sandia National Lab looking at solar thermal. Um, so essentially magnifying the light and, and using that heat that's generated to run processes. Um, there are a lot of research challenges related to that, but that is something that, that people are thinking about um, 
there's a lot of a lot of research in, in that particular topic, photo photochemical process for manufacturing. Um, does does my group do any research on how to better recycle solar cells? So that's that's also a great question. Um, we we've thought a lot about it. Uh, we we've got um, our industry members in the center that that are very interested in the circular economy, um, and and all of that and recycling. Um, my group's not directly working on that. Um, I, we basically know about what people are doing. And I, I think as far as I know, no one really has a good recycling plan for silicon panels. And at some point pretty soon uh, with this massive expansion of, of silicon uh, solar farms, there's gonna be a need to recycle panels. And that's a, that's a, a big, um, gonna be a big challenge. So for cadmium telluride, they have a pretty good strategy for recycling their panels, but for silicon, I don't know that there's anything people really know how to do very well. Um, and that's an interesting comment in, in the chat about using solar thermal to reduce the volume of natural gas using dairy pro processing. Um, yeah, just the industrial decarbonization as a term, you know, covers like food and and things like that um as well you know anything that that requires heat so that's great people are looking at solar thermal um about printing solar panels uh so there are definitely a bunch of papers out there um there, there was a pretty high profile company in California. Oh my goodness, I'm forgetting their name, but they, they were all about um, printing SIGs. So they would have a dispersion of actually metal particles, copper, indium, and gallium, and then they would selenize them. Uh, and that company um, went out of business. SIGs as a, as a technology, Going back 15 years ago, I think people thought SIGs was going to be the winner in terms of thin film and cadmium telluride has just done remarkable things. And a lot of the SIGs companies have, have gone out of business um, over the over the years. Um, there, there are probably papers and review panels on or review papers. You can feel free to send me an email if if you want some. I can try to point you in a, in the right direction for about printing solar cells. The challenge is those, well, perovskites are solution process. That's one reason people are really interested in perovskites. So um, that material is, is system and is commercially viable, but most of the, the printing, well, also organic. So you've got organic solar cells that are still, still out there, um, you know, work, working away. Those are printed as well, or a lot of them. Well, thank you, Dr. Corgill, and thank you all for attending. Um, looks like we are right around 7.30, so um, time to say good night. And uh, for all in Central Time Zone, have a great evening. Great. Good to see you. Thanks.